So let me just uh, welcome you all today. So this is uh, our UWA weekly webinar series, which we call the Science Exchange. And the idea here is that we want to promote the relevance of our UWA research and our teaching activities to you all. And we particularly call it the Science Exchange because the idea is that we really want to hear your questions and comments as much as sharing our thoughts with you. So we'll be really keen to hear your questions. Uh, my name is Linda Jeffrey. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Psychology of Psychological Science at UWA. I'm also the Director of Community uh, Engagement there. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to Gemma Kolova, who is our speaker for today. Now, Gemma is a postdoctoral research associate in the uh, Person Perception Lab in the School of Psychological Science. And her research focuses on understanding how adults form first impressions of children's faces. And she's also interested in how children themselves learn to form these impressions of other faces. Gemma is a recent uh, graduate with a PhD from uh, this university and uh, her PhD thesis was pretty fabulous. It was awarded an honourable mention on the Dean's List at UWA and that is a, a fairly rare honour. Just before Gemma gets started on her presentation, uh, she just wants you to know that in today's talk, she's not going to be showing you a lot of data or statistics that actually support the research that she will be presenting, uh, just to keep it clean and easy to follow for those who aren't familiar with that kind of stuff. But uh, she will be, there will be links available to the research. And if anyone is really interested in the data, uh, Gemma will be more than happy to talk with you about that at another time. Okay, so without further ado, I'm now going to hand you over to Gemma, who's going to be talking about first impressions and why they matter. Thanks so much, Linda. Um, and with that, I think I just jump straight into today's talk. So you've probably all heard the saying, don't judge a book by its cover, or looks can be deceiving, or beauty is only skin deep. Well, despite this advice, we actually can't help but form really rapid judgments of character just based on a glimpse of a stranger's face. So for example, when seeing this face, you might make assumptions about how trustworthy this person looks, whether they look intelligent, whether they look approachable. And what we know is that we form these impressions within milliseconds of seeing a face. And we actually can't help but make these really rapid judgments of character just based on a stranger's face. And what's also really interesting is that we actually tend to agree with other people when we form these impressions. And I'm just gonna, um, I guess, show a demonstration of this now. So I'm going to show you two faces and if you can just look at them for a moment and then hopefully a poll will pop up soon and it will ask you to choose which face you think looks more trustworthy, the face on the left or the face on the right. All right, so if we can have a look at those results now. We can see that 94% of you thought the face on the right looked more trustworthy. And now we'll just go to a second demonstration using some slightly different faces. So again, if we can just get that poll up in a minute, that will ask you whether you think the face on the left or the face on the right looks more trustworthy. So again, now we can see the majority of people, so 97% of you thought the face on the left looked more trustworthy this time. So maybe you felt in doing this exercise that these impressions, you know, they came really easily. It didn't really take much effort to think about which face you thought looked more trustworthy. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we tend to agree with others when forming these impressions. So they're not really random impressions that we make. So today I'm going to be talking a bit more about these sorts of facial first impressions. I'm going to talk about why these impressions are so important, how we form these impressions from adult and child faces, whether or not these impressions at all, are at all accurate and where these impressions actually come from. So these impressions are really important to understand because we know that they have a range of real world social consequences. And it might be completely obvious to some of you um, that more attractive people are generally more popular um, in online dating, so on things like Tinder. But these first impressions also have a range of social consequences that probably seem a bit less obvious or a bit more irrational. So for example, we also know that unattracted defendants are more likely to lose cases in the criminal justice system. And we also form impressions other than attractiveness, so more uh, subjective impressions from faces, like how trustworthy someone looks. 
And these sorts of impressions also have real world consequences. So we know that more trustworthy looking Airbnb hosts are generally more popular on Airbnb and they can charge higher rates for their accommodation. And perhaps of relevance um, of some of you listening in today, we also know that trustworthy looking researchers are generally perceived as doing good science. So that dodgy photo of you on ResearchGate might actually um, be doing not very good things for your reputation. And we also know that competent looking CEOs are more likely to be hired by large companies and they also receive larger salaries. So it's quite clear that these first impressions that we just make from a glimpse of a face have a range of social consequences. And these actually start quite early. So we know that even children um, are influenced by these impressions. So for example, we know that attractive children are perceived by smart and pop as smart and popular by teachers. And on the other hand, unattractive children are more likely to receive harsh discipline. And these social consequences are especially important to understand in childhood because this is such a crucial time of development. And any influence during child childhood could actually have long-term effects. So, for example, we know that attractive children are generally perceived as more smart by their teachers. Um, they might actually be given more challenging tasks by their teachers and then actually are given more opportunities to excel and can end up becoming more smart because of this impression. And this is something that we refer to as the self-fulfilling prophecy effect. So, of course, it's really important that we understand how we form these impressions from both adult and child faces. So how do we form these impressions? Well, this actually isn't a really easy question to answer. And when you think about all the words that you could use to describe someone just based on your first impression of them, um, there are hundreds of words that can come to mind. And it's not immediately obvious how these words relate to one another or which of these words are most important in driving our impressions. Um, and I guess as researchers, we want to, you know, make some sense of this in a scientific way. And we want to get a deeper understanding of any patterns that might underlie these sorts of impressions. So a really influential paper aimed to understand, well, how do we actually form these impressions from adult places? And what are the most kind of important impressions that we, that we form? And what they found was that all of these judgments from adult places really just boiled down to two main judgments. And they were how trustworthy an adult looked and how dominant an adult looked. And since the discovery of these two important impressions, researchers have also been able to visualize these um, impressions by using face morphs. So here we've got two faces and they're morphs of faces really. Um, and for the technically minded, how we create these morphs is we really just merge together and morph together faces that receive really high ratings of trustworthiness. And these faces receive the highest ratings of trustworthiness out of a thousand faces. So that's the face on the right. Whereas the face on the left um, is a morph that's being created by faces that received quite low impressions of trustworthiness. So basically, these morphs just kind of provide a really neat way of visualising what these dimensions look like. And you can see here that there are some common features that we associate with people who look trustworthy. So for example, um, having a, a smile on your face makes you look more trustworthy and also being a bit more feminine. Whereas the untrustworthy face has a bit more of a natural downward turn of the lip and they're a bit more masculine looking. And we can also use these morphs to visualise dominance. So the face on the right here is a face that is, I guess, an average, quite dominant looking face. So again, we can see this face is quite masculine. It's got quite a, a clear um, jawline. Whereas the face on the left, which is uh, less dominant, um, is a little bit more round. And what's really interesting about these two impressions is that it's argued that together they give us information about someone's potential for threat. So I guess what this means is when we look at a face for the first time, all of this information is telling us whether someone um, might be threatening towards us. So whether they might have good or bad intentions and whether they might be able to fulfill those intentions. And it's probably quite easy to think about how inferring threat from other adult spaces um, would be important for our ancestors. So for example, we probably would update our behavior based on these impressions. So we might wanna avoid someone that looks a bit more threatening um, whereas we could approach someone that looked less threatening. But threat isn't really something that's important for every relationship um, or, or for every face that we look at. And I guess one of the most obvious examples could be thinking of children's faces. So we know that adults don't associate threat with children, but instead it's really important for adults to kind of establish a nurturing and caring relationship with kids. 
So this raises a, an interesting question about whether the threat dimensions of trust and dominance that we know are important for adults would also apply to kids' faces or whether we might expect different impressions to be important for those faces. And this was kind of, uh, I guess, a motivator of one of my um, first research pieces, which looked at, well, how do we actually form impressions from kids' faces? And to try and, and investigate this in a scientific way, um, what, we, what we do is we ask people just to write down their first impressions based on an image of a child's face, like you can see here. And this method is the same method that was used to find out the important impressions of adult faces, but obviously here we just use kids' faces. So we asked participants about their first impressions and we didn't specifically ask them to, to tell us about the personality or the trait characteristics of the kids. So if they wanted to, participants could have just explained, um, you know, the appearance of the children. So for this image, they could have written young girl with blue eyes and freckles. But actually what we find is that participants go beyond just describing the, the physical appearance and they actually infer personality or, or trait characteristics from the, these still images. So one participant wrote shy, innocent, sweet, kind of average intelligence. And for another face, um, someone else wrote, this kid looks a bit like a bully, although he looks quite confident as well. So we can see that just based on an image of, of a face, um, people make these really elaborate descriptions and we feel like we can tell something about someone's personality. And what we did was we looked at the words that participants were fre frequently mentioning to describe uh, these sorts of traits. And as you can see here, the words that are larger were just words that were more frequently mentioned by participants. So participants mentioned things like troublemaker, serious, shy and sweet quite frequently. And what we wanted to know, well, what, what do these impressions boil down to? What are the most important impressions for kids' faces? And what we found was that there were, again, two main impressions that emerged for kids' faces. The first was based on how nice the kid looked, so whether they looked nice or naughty. And these images here are pictures of kids that were generally rated quite high for looking quite nice, whereas these kids are a little bit more naughty looking. And the second impression was how shy the kids looked. So again, here are just some typical shy looking kids, whereas here are some less shy kids or more confident. And this finding was quite interesting because at a glance, it looks like these impressions that we form of kids' faces are different to the trustworthiness and dominance impressions that we know are important for adults' faces. But of course, we really wanted to test whether or not they were the same or different. So for example, we can see some similarities between niceness and trustworthiness. So a smile signals niceness and trust. So we just wanted to check that these weren't different words for the same kind of judgment. And what we found, in fact, was that niceness impressions were really similar to trust impressions. So this kind of means that we probably make assumptions about how good or bad someone looks just based on their face. Um, but we call this kind of slightly different things in kids compared to adults. So we, call, we more think about it in terms of niceness for kids. But for the second dimension, what we found was that shyness wasn't the same as dominance. And it also wasn't just the polar opposite of dominance either. But instead, it was something that was a little bit more distinct. And this was interesting because it, it just supports that idea that um, perhaps the, the sorts of ways that we think about kids and the goals or the social goals that we have and that nurturing relationship we have towards kids is able to influence or shape the impressions that we form. And it's not really to do with threat for children, but perhaps it's more to do with something like how socially competent or vulnerable that child is. So after discovering that impressions of niceness and shyness were really important for kids' faces, the next really important question is, well, do these impressions affect how we behave towards children? So you can imagine how this can be really important, um, you know, in the real world, for example, when, when teachers interact with kids on that first day of school. So if, if teachers are thinking about kids in terms of how nice or shy they look, we want to know whether these impressions actually bias how those um, teachers behave towards the kids. So to, so to investigate how we might kind of behave differently towards kids based on their appearance, we use this face editing or face transforming technique. So as you can see here, this was a, a young photo of myself um, and we can use this face uh, editing technique that can turn the same face image and make it look more nice or make it look less nice by making it look more like those averages that I spoke about earlier. And on the left hand side there, you can just see um, that's kind of exactly how we how we do this in the face programming 
Um, so you put the little, like, I guess, dots on the important features of the face and you can transform the face to look more or less nice. So we've then asked participants, well, which child would you be most likely to give an award to for good behaviour? And we found that participants chose the face that looked more nice. And we can also do the same thing, editing the faces to make them look more or less shy. And we asked, which child would you choose to lead the class discussion? And again, we find that people tend to choose the face that looks less shy. So this result was quite important because it shows that not only do we form these spontaneous impressions from kids' faces, but we use these impressions to really influence our expectations of kids and also potentially how we behave towards them as well. So just to recap where we're at so far, we know that impressions of niceness and shyness are the two most important impressions for kids' faces. And we also know that these impressions influence our behaviour towards kids. So the next important question is, well, are these impressions accurate? Should we be relying on these impressions in the real world? And the question of whether or not these impressions are accurate is actually not a new question. And in fact, in the 1900s, there was this guide written to help people detect a deceitful eye. So we can see here that an eye like this will represent a character that is posit positively deceitful. And we can also see um, warnings for a chin as well. And I hope it doesn't take too much convincing for you to believe me um, when I say that we cannot really read a person's character just from their face. So it's not as easy as just looking at someone and knowing whether or not they might be good or bad or deceitful. But what's interesting is that research today is, is kind of still looking at whether there might be a slither of truth or a kernel of truth in these impressions. And actually what it finds is that there is actually some evidence that there might be a small amount of modest accuracy. So for example, evidence shows that facial bone structure predicts aggressive play in male hockey players. And other evidence has found that impressions of unfaithful, unfaithfulness predict self-reported cheating behaviours in men. But this issue is a little bit contentious. So not all studies have found um, significant accuracy in impressions. And in fact, there was a, um, another study, which was quite a large study, and they found that there was no relationship between cheating behaviours um, and the appearance of the participants. So it is kind of still debated in face perception literature whether or not there's even a kernel of truth in these impressions. So in some of our own research, we wanted to know, well, might there also be any, or might there be any accuracy in impressions of niceness and shyness for kids' faces? Because these are the impressions that we know are most important for children. So to look at this question, what we did was we collected images of children's faces. And to do this, we just asked parents to send in photographs of their children. And these were typically just photos that they already had on their phone. And we also had information from those parents about the shy and nice behaviours of those kids. So, for example, we asked um, parents, how frequently does your child uh, help kids younger than themselves? Um, and that was a question that we wanted to use to measure niceness. And what we found was, well, the, the reports from the parents about how the kids behave, so how nice those kids might behave in real life, actually related to how nice the kids looked in the images suggesting that there might be this small amount of, I guess, small kernel of truth in impressions of niceness. And we did the same for shyness, but what we found here was that there was no significant relationship. So what this means really is that um, what kids looked like or how shy they looked in the images didn't really relate to how shy um, their parents reported them as behaving. And this result, I guess, raises an, a really interesting and important question, and that is, well, why might there even be a kernel of, of truth in some of these impressions? Um, and one explanation um, is something that I kind of mentioned earlier, and that's the self-fulfilling prophecy effect. So perhaps kids who look nice might be treated more positively and then in turn develop into nicer children later on. Another explanation is that there, there could be something in the face itself that is actually signalling this accurate information. And of course, that would be really interesting to find out, well, what is it in the face that, that could be signalling whether or not a kid is nice? Um, and I guess another thing to keep in mind is the way that we collected these images, in our study at least, was we asked parents to just send in natural photographs of their kids. So another possibility is that more nice kids might just be more likely to smile for their parent or just might have been captured um, in, a, in a more happy kind of um, mannerism, I guess, than kids who are not nice. So it's really important to think about all the reasons why these impressions sometimes might contain some accuracy, 
because from a theoretical perspective, it's, it's interesting to understand, well, where does this accuracy kind of come from? But from a practical perspective, it's really important to emphasize that when we talk about accuracy, we're talking at above chance levels. So not every participant formed accurate impressions. And even for those participants who did form accurate impressions, they were certainly not at levels that suggest we should be relying on these impressions in everyday life. So, so basically these impressions aren't accurate enough to be relying on them. And of course, this is really important when we think about all the social kind of consequences of these impressions. So if anything, we should be, we should think about them in terms of visual biases rather than things that we should be judging um, or trusting when we behave towards others. And then just the final part of today's talk, I'm just going to talk about the origin of impressions. And so where do these impressions come from? Because obviously this is really important to understand given all the social consequences. And to look at where these impressions might come from, a lot of researchers examine kids' impressions because if, if children form mature impressions, that would suggest that it doesn't really take much social experience for, for us to form these impressions, but they kind of come quite naturally. So what research has found is that actually infants as young as seven months old are sensitive to facial trustworthiness. So infants actually prefer looking at faces that look more trustworthy. And other research has found that children by the time they're three years and older tend to agree with, agree with each other when assigning nice and mean judgments to faces. So what this suggests is it probably doesn't take much social experience at all for us to form these impressions, but we actually form them quite early in life. And in some of our own um, research, we find that by primary school age, children form almost identical impressions of niceness as compared to adults. Again, just emphasizing that it doesn't take a lot of social experience in order to form these sorts of impressions. Uh, but this, this certainly isn't to say that social experiences don't have any influence on our impressions. And actually in some of our um, recent research, we found that social experiences can influence who we learn to trust. And to look at this, we recruited identical and non-identical adult twin participants. And twins are really cool to recruit because we know that identical twins share the exact same genetic makeup, whereas non-identical twins on average share about 50% of the same genes. And this is important because it means that any differences between identical and non-identical twins can be attributed to the genetic makeup. So we asked twins about their impressions of trust of faces. And what we found was that not everyone agreed. So if you remember even back to the very first poll today, not everyone picked the right face. There was about three or 4% of people who chose the other face. So there are some small but really meaningful differences in who we think looks tr trustworthy. And what was also interesting was that identical twins didn't form more similar impressions than strangers or than non-identical twins. So again, this suggests that it's probably our personal environment that is influencing these impressions of trust rather than our genetic makeup. So what this, what this kind of means is that as we you know, go about our daily life and the sorts of social experiences that we have in our daily life, these interactions probably influence who we learn to trust. So just to take a simple example, if I happen to have really positive and trustworthy experiences with a best friend of mine who has blue eyes, I might later attribute all blue-eyed people to be more trustworthy, um, even though that's not necessarily true. So I think a really interesting future direction will be to look at, well, what are the experiences that influence these impressions? And other, other questions that we're looking at in our lab um, are, can children update their impressions of trust after seeing how people actually behave? And whether gender biases also influence children's impressions. So most of the research that I've spoken about today was conducted here at the School of Psychological Science um, at UWA. And it was done with the help of a lot of um, staff and students from the Person Perception Lab, as well as some international collaborators. So I'd just like to thank them as well for all of their help. And just as a final plug for the university, if any of you um, are really interested by any of the things that I've spoken about today, or you're interested about studying psychology, um, UWA has a really great program here and it's, it would definitely be a great place to study.
So thank you, I'm open to take questions. Thanks very much for that, Gemma. Guys, if you want to start uh, typing your questions in, we've got a few come in already that came in uh, while Gemma was speaking. So we've got one here from Diana, who thanks you for an interesting talk so far. And because uh, she typed this in the middle, and she's just wondering if these impressions of children are moderated by the sex of the child. Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. So I haven't actually looked to see whether these impressions um, I guess there hasn't been a, a really strong study to look at any sex differences. In some of my own research, I guess we analysed the data separately for the female and male faces kind of post hoc just to explore whether there might be differences. Um, and we found consistently that these impressions of niceness and shyness, they emerge from both female and male faces. So it doesn't seem to be that these impressions um, are different necessarily, like we form them from both female and male faces, um, but there might be more subtle differences that we, that I guess that analysis wouldn't have been sensitive to. Um, and another, I guess, interesting thing here is that impressions of shyness, um, one cue for how shy someone looks can be kind of how masculine. So generally the more masculine a face, the less shy they're perceived, um, or the more feminine, the more shy they're perceived. So we can see that um, facial masculinity and, and potentially facial cues of sex might be interacting a little bit with the with the um, impressions, but generally speaking, these impressions seem important for both faith, for both genders. Cool. Um, I've got a question here from Anonymous uh, saying, should we rely on our first impressions, and if so, to what extent? Cool. So as I kind of touched on a little bit, um, I guess the take home message, even though we did find there was this, you know, small kernel of truth in impressions, the take home message is that this, this isn't, or this accuracy, I guess, is not at a level that we should be trusting in everyday life. So although it might be theoretically interesting that there's this, you know, small kernel of truth, from a practical perspective, we kind of should be thinking about them in terms of biases that we're having. And if anything, we should really be trying to tell ourselves not to rely on these impressions. We should be doing the opposite. <laughs> Cool. Thanks for that. Okay, I've got a question here from Lashindri. I hope I've said that right. Thank you for the talk. And asking, would the impressions of niceness and shyness be influenced by facial expressions? Yeah, so that's a really um, interesting question. And in some of our research, which I didn't really get to present today, but we, we wanted to find out, well, what is it in a face that makes someone look more nice or make someone look more shy? And one really critical thing is the emotional expression that people are displaying. But this doesn't always mean like a really explicit emotional expression. Sometimes people just have, has a, have a face that looks a little bit naturally smiley or naturally grumpy if you have eyebrows that kind of um, point downwards. So these can be more subtle, I guess, sensitivities to emotional expression as well. But what we found was that, yeah, indeed, having a face that looks a little bit more smiley or, or even just smiling in general, does make you look more nice as a kid. Um, and obviously the more angry you look, um, the more naughty you might look. So there are, there are a few different emotions that can influence these sorts of impressions. Cool. I've got a technical question from Lee that came in while you were speaking. She's, uh, she or he is interested to know what the population uh, was that was surveyed about who they would, um, uh, their behaviour towards kids, so who they would give awards to or who would lead the, the class discussion. What was the sample you tested that on? So we, for that study, we just tested a sample. The sample was from the University of Western Australia. Um, and we actually didn't have a very big sample size at all. For that study, I think we had something like 20 participants who we asked them about um, their behaviour and these kind of, you know, made up scenarios. Um, and it was quite compelling that even with that relatively, you know, modest sample size, we found quite large effects. The participants were consistently choosing the face um, that looked, you know, that matched kind of the description. Um, I will say there were reasons for us choosing the sample size. We, we knew from previous research the sample size didn't need to be massive um, in order to find the, the effect that we were expecting. Um, and yeah, and in fact, it, it, was, it was seen pretty consistent across the participants. Cool. I've got a question here now from Bastian saying, is there any research on children forming first impressions of other children and how that guides their behaviour? 
and Bastian also sends his greetings from Tilburg, one of our <laughs> national attendees. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in internationally. Um, yeah, really interesting question. And that's something that we've been interested too. So in some of our own research, we looked at how kids formed impressions of niceness and shyness from kids' faces. Um, and I kind of, I really quickly went over this data at the end, but what we found was that kids' impressions were really similar to adults' impressions. Um, and the correlation was like above 0.9 for impressions of niceness, suggesting at least by like a, a primary school age, these impressions of children's impressions of children's faces um, are quite mature. But I totally agree that there actually, there actually isn't that much research done looking at kids' impressions of other children's faces. And I really feel like that's going to be, um, you know, an important uh, place for us to start doing some research, I guess. Oh, thanks. I have a question here from our friend Kay uh, asking, noting that you found a correlation between children's actual niceness and how nice they looked, but not their actual shyness and how shy they look. Could there be a parental reporting bias where they don't want to be so honest about how shy their kids, kid is? So have you tried asking teachers, for example, to rate the shyness instead of adults? Yeah, so that would be interesting. So we only just, I guess, um, no, we haven't done that basically, but I think it would be obviously interesting to get some different sort of perspective into how the kids might be behaving. I don't know if, if parents would really be biased to not, I'm not sure if I fully believe that there's a bias to make your kid not look, not, um, I guess, behave more shy, especially compared to niceness. If there was any bias, I guess, we would probably expect it to be coming from, um, from the questions about niceness. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that's something interesting. And I guess another important thing to think about with, in terms of shyness is the way that we uh, collected the images was we just asked parents to send in photographs of their own kid. So another possibility is that kids don't really act shy around their parents, even if they are shy around strangers, which is really what, what shyness is about. Um, so if maybe it's something more to do with the photographs not capturing the shy tendencies of kids because it's in the context of the parents sending um, that photo in. But yeah, I definitely agree. It would be interesting to at least see how these different impressions from different sources of um, behaviour at least, um, if, if we would find a similar pattern of results for teachers. Um, I have another question from Diana here saying, are there any suggestions on how um, first impressions of children, especially the negative ones, could be mitigated? Sorry, could you just say that last bit again? So are there any suggestions on how we could mitigate the kind uh, of negative impressions that people might form of a kid's face, for example? Yeah, so there isn't much research into this at the moment, but I guess... I think the first step is really just being aware that we're forming these impressions because a lot of the time we don't really think about how these impressions are biasing our behaviour and it happens all the time. It happens, you know, on Airbnb, it happens in the workplace. Um, so I think if people were first just aware that these biases exist and then the impressions that we form are not at a level of accuracy that we should be relying on every day, I think that would be a really important step in kind of reducing these biases. Um, and unfortunately, we know that these biases are kind of sticky. So even when we tell people not to look at someone's face to form these impressions or try to encourage them to focus more on their behaviour, we find that people can't really help but form these impressions from faces. So, uh, yeah, I guess I, I feel like perhaps the, the best thing to do is just kind of have that reflective, encourage people to be reflective and to think, OK, did I just judge that person on their face? Um, and, and I guess try to internalise any biases that we might have. Cool. Now I'm just going to pop to one here from Anonymous, another Anonymous, because I'm sure this is a burning question for many people. How, as an individual, would you try and modify the first impression? For example, if you're prone to the commonly known resting bitch face. <laughs> That's a great question. So I guess, um, I guess the question comes to what makes someone look trustworthy and how can we make ourselves look more trustworthy? And as I kind of mentioned earlier on, um, 
emotional expressions really influence these impressions. So having a bit more of a smiley face can make you look instantly more trustworthy. So I guess the good news is the really cheap and easy way to make yourself look trustworthy is just to smile a bit more or frown a bit less or, you, you know, take more photos of you smiling. Um, but we also know other things like looking a bit more feminine or a bit more attractive also influence impressions of trust. Um, but perhaps those things are a little bit more difficult to, to modify. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, a couple of people have asked this question, um, but are, are Amy and Anonymous. Um, have you examined whether racial characteristics influence, influence first impressions in both children and adults? Yeah, so no, I haven't actually um, looked at how race might interact um, with these sorts of impressions, which I think is a really important, obviously, um, in a future direction. Um, so in the research that I use, I normally restrict it to Caucasian faces just because we know that there are other race effects. So what that means is people tend to be poorer at simple things like recognising other race faces. And that might mean that we form different impressions of those faces. Um, and of course, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Some researchers looked to see whether the same dimensions or the same you know, impressions of trust and dominance um, emerge for different race faces and actually there's a, a really large scale international project looking at that at the moment and they find in generally speaking these dimensions look quite consistent although there might be subtle differences um, there's remarkable consistency in trust um, and dominance is emerging as quite important impressions but yeah in terms of racial biases and whether stereotypes might be cueing those impressions there's yeah definitely less work has been has been done into that even though um it's a really timely um topic i think cool um we've got another little technical question here um marty's asking how long the faces are typically shown for in your study are they brief presentations or long presentations and does it matter yeah, so in our studies, we just leave the faces up until participants respond. So they have as long as they want to respond, but um, usually they don't take that long. So you, even in that first um, demonstration that you did today, it didn't take very long for people or for the majority of people to agree. Other researchers kind of added, um, you know, time limitations onto the faces to see how quickly we can actually form these impressions. And that research has found that even if you flash a face up for like less than 50 milliseconds, people form impressions that are quite consistent with the face that's just left on the screen for an unlimited amount of time. So it seems to be that we form these impressions really fast and it doesn't really matter how long the face is up on the screen for. Cool. Another question from Marty, which is an interesting one. So she's asking whether the impressions are controllable. So for example, if we inform people about these biases, um, tell people in courts, judges, for example, can they then go on to control and reduce the first impression biases? Which you kind of touched on earlier, but this is kind of into mm. real world scenarios now. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think there is some um, um, research that, that I'm not super on top of into that space, but I know that there's been some research where they tell people that, you know, that these biases exist and not to, you know, trust the face in, in these games that they play. And what they find is that even then, um, people can't help but, but be influenced by the facial first impression. Although I think it kind of reduces the reliance on it a little bit, but it's still, it's still there. Um, and another interesting finding in some related research is that even when you, um, well, we get participants to, to play a trust game with other players and they get the option to view the face when they're playing that game or not to view the face. And you'd think that most people shouldn't view the face because the face isn't really going to, well, technically speaking, it shouldn't tell you anything more accurate about how that person's going to behave in that online trust game. But participants really, um, I guess, they pay extra money in this game to be able to view the face. So it just goes to show you how we really, I guess, have this instinct that we want to see someone else's face and maybe we, maybe we do believe that we can form some sort of accurate impression from those faces. So we've, we're just finishing up. We've just got time for a last question now. I'm actually going to ask one that's coming just at the end because I think it's an interesting one to finish on. Um, this is from Magriette saying, what do you think are some real world implications for the findings of your research? For example, should job interviews be faceless in order to reduce this bias? Or should we in fact rely on the biases if they do are giving us a little bit of kernel of truth? 
Hi. Um, great question. So I guess the most practical advice we could really give people is we shouldn't be, I guess, we definitely shouldn't be putting photos of ourselves up on things like our CV because we know that even in business context, these impressions really influence our decisions. So, um, you know, definitely in those sorts of contexts, we shouldn't be putting photos of ourselves up. But it's kind of, it almost goes against it, our intuitive because as an employer, you want to see a photograph of someone because you probably feel that you can tell something about their personality. But what we know from evidence is that the, the, the impression that you form from that photograph on a CV, for example, um, is not really accurate at a level that we should be relying on it. So if anything, the, I guess the practical implication should be that we shouldn't be um, putting these images in places where we think they could have, you know, consequences like in the workforce. Okay, well, sadly, even though we've got heaps more questions, we've run out of time. So, so thanks, Gemma, for a fascinating talk. And thanks to everyone for all of your fascinating questions. We hope to see some of you back with us next week. Cheerio. Bye.